everyone. Um, it's my pleasure uh, this morning to do a quick introductory um, uh, introduction to the real introduction. Um, as hopefully all of you now know, uh, Dr. Jay Powell um, um, is returning to the, the University of Washington um, in January uh, to be the surgical director of our transplant and mechanical circulatory support program. Uh, we're all very excited. Um, um, during the recruitment process, Jay and I had a lot of uh, discussions and he kept talking about this great investigator at University of Colorado, Bill Cornwell, and what fabulous work he was doing. And so I started looking at some of his publications and um, um, I'll just say, you, you know, nowadays in the days of CRISPR and molecular biology, it's a little unusual to have an investigator who is committed to doing human based um, physiology uh, research. And I thought it would be really nice for him to come and just give us an update on some of the work he's doing. And um, then, of course, it seemed, uh, uh, since they're good friends, uh, that it would be best for Jay to do the introduction. So I'm going to turn it over to Jay now, but just uh, welcome, Bill, and thank you for uh, speaking this morning. Take it away, Jay. You have to unmute yourself. Though. Julia, can you unmute Jay? I just asked him to unmute. Um, he's saying he can't. There we go. That seemed to have worked. All right. Well, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Thank you, Rob. Um, you know, I'm very excited to be coming back to Seattle, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Bill Cornwell. I've gotten to know Bill over the last several years here in Colorado. And, um, you know, Bill sent me a really nice introduction this morning to, to read out and uh, kind of mention some of his uh, accomplishments, but Bill is undeniably humble, and so thought I might go off script a little bit. I hope that's okay, Bill. <laughs> so, um, in the time that I've gotten to know Bill, a couple of things have stood out to me. One is, uh, for somebody at his relatively early stage of career, he's been very productive, and as Rob mentioned, he's studying human physiology in a way that very few people do. And part of that I'm sure is related to his time in Ben Levine's lab in Dallas. And he turns out that Bill's only a handful of cardiologists in the country with a specific skill set to kind of understand ventricular physiology in a much more granular way than most of us ever think about. But what really struck me over the last several years is that maybe it's because of Bill's research uh, training, he approaches clinical dilemmas in a much more open-minded way than you would think for someone who's participated in writing society guidelines and protocols and scientific statements and so on. And it's not uncommon when Bill's on service that he will rethink even the most basic aspects of a patient's care, uh, oftentimes uh, leading to some change in management that is incredibly valuable. Uh, another example is when we will often have a bad patient in clinic, as I'm sure most of you know, these patients will end up with some set of bad alarms that we can't really understand from their fluid status or their weight or whatnot. And one of the resources that we have is that we call Bill. He does an exercise cap and a bad interrogation. He usually leads to some understanding of their physiology that is not representative of what we see uh, of the patient in clinic. So with all of these things in mind, um, you know, Bill has been an enormous asset to the program here, um, both with his academic productivity and also his clinical care of, of uh, many of these patients. So, um, you know, again, I'm very excited um, to be introducing Bill, and I look forward to hearing more uh, about the work that he's been doing. Thanks so much. Take it away, Bill. Okay. Good morning. Thanks, guys. Uh, Jay, thank you. Uh, this is a very very nice and warm uh, introduction. Um, Jay has been uh, wonderful to work with the past four years. He will be missed in Colorado and um, um, we'll make his presence known here very quickly and I'm sure in a very good way. Um, but thank you for that introduction. And um, what I wanted to speak about this morning was uh, the title of my talk, Right Ventricular um, Function, really across the spectrum of health and disease. I think as we can all appreciate, there is much less known 
about right ventricular function compared to the left ventricle, um, but there are um, lots of emerging data um, uh, teaching us more, uh, more questions than answers, so to speak, at this stage of the game. But I wanted to take a few minutes and just talk about what we do know and where we are going um, with all of this, this information. These are my disclosures for the day, the day's presentation. Learning objectives for today. So number one, appreciate the role of the right ventricle in resting and exertional cardiovascular performance. Secondly, understand how the right ventricle is adversely impacted by different disease states and condition conditions. And then to describe the adaptive capacity of the right ventricle in response to internal and external stressors. So a few thoughts um, before we get into the details here that will um, govern much of today's discussion. First of all, um, I want to point out that a supine resting assessment of the heart does not adequately portray the cardiovascular performance in response to increased metabolic demand. Along those lines, despite the fact that you may do a right heart catheterization under supine resting conditions, the RV may be quite dysfunctional despite the fact that you have a normal right atrial pressure, which we often use as a surrogate of overall right ventricular function. And then uh, furthermore, a normal visual assessment by echo or MRI, again, under supine resting conditions, does not rule out a myopathic right ventricle. And exercise testing frequently unmasks cardiovascular pathophysiology. Um, and exercise may be required to characterize the severity of abnormalities, um, particularly when patients um, come in reporting symptoms with routine activities of daily living. This is a case in point. So these, uh, these uh, images are from Barry Borlaug up in Mayo where he was uh, showing that you can unmask HEFPEF during invasive exercise testing um, when you evaluate patients with unexplained dyspnea. And if you, on the y-axis here, we're looking at wedge pressure um, and then on the x-axis, different um, levels of activity. But if all you had here was just a supine resting assessment, you would see that the wedge pressure was normal and you would falsely conclude that this patient does not have any cardiovascular disease. Uh, um, however, within one minute of exercising, you can see that this patient with HEFPEF has a wedge pressure that skyrockets into the 20s and 30s and sometimes approaching 40, which again emphasizes the fact that if we have patients who are reporting symptoms with routine activities of daily living, then we may need to incorporate exercise into our uh, uh, um, diagnostic modality and algorithms. And this is an example from our lab that I, I just like to point out because it highlights the extent of hemodynamic abnormalities that we see in our patients. So this is a, an individual that was referred to me who had uh, heart failure, and it was not entirely clear why he had symptoms beyond what was anticipated. Uh, but if you look at these hemodynamic waveforms, at different uh, levels of exercise. So in the middle, we're looking at submaximal exercise. And then on the right, we're looking at peak exercise capacity. But what I really wanna point out here are the submaximal data. Um, one of my observations has been that we sacrifice some of the most important data during stress testing, meaning the submaximal data in order to get the peak data. Yes, the peak data are important, they're prognostic, but patients don't live at their peak level of performance. They wanna know why they have difficulties walking down the grocery store, why they can't clean the kitchen, these sorts of things. So we go to great lengths to try to understand the physiology or pathophysiology under real world activities of daily living. And what you can see here, while the resting hemodynamics are not normal, we're looking at pulmonary arterial pressure, wedge pressure, and blood pressure, they skyrocket simply with routine activities of daily living. This is exercise on an upright stationary cycle ergometer at a workload that is well below ventilatory threshold. And you can see wedge pressures are in the 30s, which um, increase to the 40s at peak activity, which again underscores this notion that if we want to understand what is happening with our patients during uh, upright, normal routine activities of daily living, a supine resting assessment is not adequate. So with that backdrop, we can then start to turn to right ventricular function and think about how the right ventricle behaves in different um, healthier diseased states, both at rest and during activity. And there've been two uh, helpful statements, one from the NIH, NHLBI, and the second from the AHA in the past couple of years. And just to highlight a couple of things um, that they have mentioned uh, to set the stage for where we're going this morning, uh, this is a, a description from the NHLBI about the, the quote unquote, the path moving forward 
to try to transition from phenotype to therapy to develop novel therapeutic targets for patients with right ventricular dysfunction. So just to point your attention to the boxes, number one, to understand RV function across the spectrum of, peripheral, of uh, pulmonary vascular disease phenotypes. Number two, on the right, to assess RV structure and function, which then can lead to understanding the pathobiology of the right ventricle. And then finally, developing novel therapeutic targets to improve outcomes for these patients. So today, I'm going to primarily focus on number one and number two, since I think we're probably all in agreement at this point in time that we don't have a clear answer to number four on the bottom left. Specific recommendations from the NHLBI um, from this document, number one, to understand how demographics affect RV function across the lifespan and how these factors uh, modulate development of RV dysfunction. Second, to investigate the role of systemic comorbidities and modifiable risk factors in mediating RV health, the transition from RV health to dysfunction. And then finally, to study differences between diseases to understand RV responses to different pathologies, and then to use these profiles as a construct that can explain mechanisms of, of RV failure that will then lead to identification of novel therapies. If we think about the AHA statement, there are some very interesting um, comments made, and I just want to point out uh, the RV has historically been referred to as, quote unquote, the forgotten ventricle, the dark side of the moon, even a mere bystander, so to speak. And one statement that I think is particularly provocative, not so much in a good way, and I'll just quote it here from this statement. It is remarkable how misunderstood are some basic concepts of right-sided heart dysfunction among practicing clinicians and the impact that such misunderstanding can have on appropriate patient management. A couple of examples of figures I've taken from uh, this AHA statement. This is an example of pressure volume loops um, from different disease states. So in A and blue, you can see normal. B is a patient with a compensated uh, but pressure overloaded state, so to speak. And then C um, is a decompensated pressure overload. But what is interesting about this is that if you follow the paper trail as to where these pressure volume loops came from, it actually comes from a pediatric heart failure review. Great loops, great information, but if you look at the broader picture here, what I'm telling you is that in a statement on management of adults with RV dysfunction, the only PV loops that we have available came from a pediatric heart population, which tells me that there's a lot of information we need to learn about the right ventricle in adults in different diseased states. I think this is something we probably can all appreciate. You've probably all seen a similar graph like this before, but if you think about longitudinal changes in hemodynamics over time and how that influences RV dysfunction, it's not surprising that if you have a chronic disease state such as primary pulmonary hypertension, PAH, IPAH, what have you, as PA pressures rise and PVR increases over time, eventually the right side of the heart begins to fail. There's no surprise there, we all know that. This is another figure taken from the AHA scientific statement, um, which shows on the y-axis here, stroke volume. And then on the x-axis, we're looking basically at increases in afterload of the right ventricle on the left and the left ventricle on the right side. I think this is something we can all appreciate and we all understand that yes, as RV afterload increases, the RV is an afterload sensitive ventricle and you do see significant reductions in stroke volume. But what I would challenge is that yes, that is true, but I think that's perhaps a little simplistic. If this is where our understanding of the right ventricle stops, then we've got a lot to learn. There must be more to the story than this. And otherwise, anything in life that causes afterload to increase would precipitate RV failure. For example, exercise. If this was true, this is the only thing that happens when afterload increases, stroke volume falls, and every time you get up and walk around, you would suffer from RV failure and you would have a very low exercise capacity and everybody would be complaining of heart failure. So with that in mind, as we think about some of these basic background principles for the right ventricle, I wanna take kind of a survey across the spectrum of health and disease. On the left, if we think about world-class athletes what, or normal recreational healthy athletes, weekend warriors, so to speak. Um, and then as we transition more to uh, ambulatory heart failure, whether it's HEFPEF, HEFREF, all the way down to uh, patients requiring advanced therapies, each one of these populations has something to teach us about the right ventricle and how it behaves under different hemodynamic conditions and under different diseased states. If we think about exercise, uh, generally speaking, um, there are two uh, components, so to speak, 
of exercise. One you can think of as a quote unquote dynamic component, which uh, refers more to like a volume load on the heart. And then the second is a static component, which is more of a pressure load and over time leads to concentric remodeling of the heart. And I bring this up because I want to emphasize that uh, the, the, the body responds quite in quite dramatically different. Uh, there are quite dramatic responses depending on the type of exercise that you engage in. So just to walk through what we know about cardiovascular responses to dynamic versus static types of exercise. Well, oxygen uptake increases dramatically with dynamic types of exercise, running, cycling, these types of things, but not so much with uh, uh, isometric or static types of exercise. Cardiac output increases dramatically with dynamic exercise. Stroke volume increases with dynamic exercises, but really not a whole lot at all with static types of exercise. And then uh, the um, uh, peripheral response, total peripheral resistance re uh, drops dramatically during dynamic exercise, but again, it doesn't drop in static. It increases rather, um, rather impressively compared to the dynamic uh, response to exercise. And that's important. If you think about the overall um, equation for blood pressure, mean arterial pressure is uh, the product of cardiac output and TPR. Um, these different types of responses to exercise explain a lot about the, path, the, the physiology that we see in a normal heart and the pathophysiology that we see in both the left ventricle and the right ventricle, depending on the type of exercise that our patients are participating in. This is um, from the ACC. Uh, this is a very nice way to think about how different types of activities and exercise stress the left and the right side of the hearts. And what they've done here is they have broken down different exercises according to the degree of a static component component that you see on the y-axis versus the uh, dynamic component that you see on the x-axis. And I just highlight a couple of the more common activities that you see here. So things like golf and yoga really have a minimal stress on the cardiovascular system, whereas things like running, cross-country skiing, that's a highly dynamic component. Uh, rock climbing would be like a highly static component with a minimal dynamic component. But then um, things like canoeing and cycling are both highly dynamic and highly static. So um, I should say all that to say this, that not all exercise is the same. The type of activity that you engage in imparts uh, marked differences in the hemodynamic responses and the impact that they have on left and right ventricular function. This slide is an example of the types of um, uh, protocols that we incorporate to study uh, left and right-sided heart function in patients really across the spectrum of health and disease. Um, this will serve kind of as a framework for a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today. So I just want to take a minute to highlight what exactly it is that we're looking at. Um, when we, when we um, uh, have our patients undergo invasive cardiopulmonary exercise testing, we uh, uh, go through a variety of exercise intensities in red and blue. These are steady state levels of exercise well below the ventilatory threshold. And again, I said a few minutes ago, it's important to characterize how the heart and lungs respond under real world activities of daily living. And that's what we do here. Um, we spend a lot of time monitoring hemodynamics, cardiac output, gas exchange parameters, the blood pressure response to exercise. So really following the entirety of the oxygen cascade to try to identify the severity of abnormalities and where they fall um, within that O2 cascade. Patients are uh, given a short break, and then we complete a symptom-limited cardiopulmonary exercise test so that we can maximally stress the system to learn all that we can about the heart and lungs across the spectrum of health and disease and across varying intensities of ex exercise. Now, um, we have, as Jay mentioned at the outset, we are uh, uh, quite blessed to have some advanced, sophisticated technologies, and I'm going to show you a lot of data today. Uh, from uh, pressure volume loops, which we derive from these conductance catheters. If you've never seen one of these before, these are fun little uh, pieces of equipment. They're pig shell tape catheters that can be advanced into either the left or the right ventricle. They provide a real-time assessment of changes in volume throughout the cardiac cycle and changes in pressure. So you can put those together and recreate a pressure volume loop. Why are these things so powerful? Well, they give you a lot of information that you otherwise couldn't get from a traditional Swan-Gans catheter. Again, we have a right atrial pressure, which we use as a surrogate to tell us all about the right ventricle, but these things will tell you about contractility, lucitropy or diastolic function, relaxation, myocardial energetics, and then ventricular arterial coupling. 
So if we use that um, to first describe the healthy right ventricle, these are data that we published a couple of years ago now, just looking at uh, how the right ventricle behaves in a healthy heart, never been looked at before. Um, white is rest, red and blue are these two submaximal levels of exercise, and then gold is uh, peak exercise capacity. Like I said, lots of information. And my, my, my goal here isn't that you recognize or memorize every single graph here. It's more just to show you the wealth of information that can be derived from this type of analysis. Submaximal peak exercise data combined with invasive testing with a conductance catheter to really characterize right ventricular function in high detail in a way that's never been done before. So we have several metrics of contractility. We have metrics of lucitropy and the myocardial energetics. And one of the things I wanna point out, just a couple of things here. First, the healthy RV has a substantial amount of contractile reserve. We tend to underlook that. We all know the right ventricle is a thin walled structure, particularly compared to the left ventricle. And it's not really appreciated that the right ventricle actually can augment contractility dramatically as you progress through increasing levels of intensity of exercise. And then secondly, the RV is not a bystander, quote unquote. It actively facilitates venous return. If we think about the factors that are involved with bringing blood back to the heart, there are regional vasodilatory forces. There's the muscle pump of exercise. But something that I think was not previously appreciated was the increase in lucitropy that the right ventricle displays and that it actively contributes to pulling blood back to the heart to augment cardiac output going back out to the body. That all said, I want to start to, like I said before, we're going to walk across the spectrum of health and disease, starting first with elite athletes. We all know, uh, uh, based on um, a growing amount of data, that athletes are healthy individuals. No surprise there. If we look at a meta-analysis of over 40,000 um, athletes versus the general population, um, uh, highly active athletes, endurance athletes have a lower rate of mortality, lower cardiovascular death, lower, cardio, lower cancer death. And then if we look at data from um, athletes uh, uh, participating in the Tour de France, overall, they again have a lower mortality compared to the French population. And there are, there are a number of extra cardiac benefits as well, reductions in neoplasms, respiratory disease, digestive disease. So a lot of benefits associated with engaging in an active lifestyle. However, the uh, uh, endurance athletic type of events may actually be harmful to the right ventricle. So this is a study looking at competitive athletes who engaged in endurance athletics and they underwent a cardiac MRI before and after varying types of events, anywhere from three to 11 hours in duration. And what you can see is that following completion of the event, all metrics of RV function declined compared to the baseline pre-assessment evaluation with cardiac MRI. RV volumes increase, systolic function declines following completion of that event. And it appears that the severity of dysfunction increases in proportion to the duration of exercise. So if you look at a marathon, for example, here displayed in a yellow, about three hours, we see slight decrements in RV function versus uh, patients or individuals completing an ultra marathon or a triathlon of 11 hours in intensity, we see much lower or much greater increases or decrements in RV function. Now, uh, thankfully, RV dysfunction typically improves 24 to 48 hours following completion of an event. That said, um, the more athletic you are, you are more susceptible or prone to chronic changes, chronic remodeling of the right ventricle. And we do see those uh, splayed out over time. And why would that be? Why would prolonged exercise disproportionately affect the right ventricle? We know that these patients, these individuals don't go into LV failure following a marathon, for example, but the RV is dysfunctional. Why is that? Well, there are some very nice data from the Australian group to show that there is a disproportionate increase in RV wall stress compared to the left ventricle during exercise, which in part explains why the longer you exercise, the more intense it is the more likely you are to see decrements in RV function. Now, so far, the only data that we have seen are non-invasive assessments prior to and following uh, an endurance event. So what we wondered was, what does the heart actually look like during an event? And is, could you actually do an invasive CPET during prolonged exercise? This um, is a study that we are currently doing in our lab. This is a, a professional athlete 
completing the cycling portion of a triathlon, so 180 kilometers with one of these conductance catheters in his heart so that we can in real time evaluate right ventricular function and see how it changes longitudinally over time as this individual progresses through a, uh, an endurance event. And some very interesting things emerge. If you just look at these pressure volume loops, I'm showing you the first four hours. And if you don't know anything else about a pressure volume loop, I think we can all appreciate that the wider the loops, the greater the stroke volume. And what you can see is that as you transition from rest to, to 30 minutes, one hour, the loop widens, which means stroke volume is going up, cardiac output is going up. And then he kind of settles into a steady state um, where he's going to remain for the duration of exercise. But when you get to around two, three, four hours, interesting things emerge. Stroke volume declines, metrics of contractility decline, the heart rate increases in order to try to sustain that same level of work. So right before us, we start to see some evidence of RV dysfunction in real time during an endurance event. What about patients with heart failure? So if we first talk about individuals with HEF-PEF, we see that HEF-PEF really is a biventricular or globally myopathic problem. It does not just affect the left ventricle, it also affects the right ventricle. So what we're looking at here, we what we had were individuals um, do a simple hand grip maneuver. So they're lying flat in bed, gripping a device on the top where it says 100% maximum voluntary contraction. They're gripping as hard as they can. And you can see that that causes heart rate to go up uh, dramatically and also pulmonary arterial pressures to increase. We're measuring that with a Swan-Gans catheter here. And then we replace that catheter and we put in a conductance catheter and we look at pressure volume loops and we can see a dramatic upward shift in individuals with HEFPEF in response to increases in pulmonary arterial pressures. And this is another way to graphically demonstrate the same thing. Beta stiffness constants are a, are a way that you can analyze the diastolic limb of a pressure volume loop. And you can see red versus blue. We see a large upward shift, which underscores the fact that the right ventricle is a stiff ventricle in HEFPEF. It is not limited to just the left side of the heart. The right side of the heart is also quite stiff. And that's um, demonstrated here very nicely from the German group, where they did a similar thing. They had healthy individuals with uh, uh, nine individuals and compared the hemodynamic response to hand grip exercise among healthy individuals versus people with HEFPEF. And you can see in blue, healthy individuals move along the same uh, pressure volume relationship or that same end diastolic pressure volume ratio, whereas individuals with HEFPEF, we see again this dramatic upward shift, again underscoring the fact that HEFPEF is a diffusely myopathic process that affects both sides of the heart. What about uh, dynamic types of exercise, which I would say, I would argue more adequately mimic real world activities of daily living. Again, this is the um, healthy control data I showed you before, just as a reference for what a healthy RV looks like. If we then uh, change it up and we do the same thing to individuals with HEFREF, we see, or HEFPEF, we see that contractility is not the problem here. The problem is it's a stiff heart. <clears throat> In contrast to the healthy right ventricle where the loops stay um, low along the y-axis, meaning end diastolic pressure is low. In HEFPEF, end diastolic pressure is quite high. If you combine that with data from the previous slide, this underscores um, the fact that HEFPEF leads to a very stiff right side of the heart where you have impairments and lose atropic reserve. And uh, the right ventricle in HEFPEF actually does retain the ability to augment cardiac output. What about HEF-REF? We see something dramatically different. Again, on the, on the left, we're looking at the healthy control that I showed you before, just again, as a reminder. And in HEF-REF, we see something dramatically different than the healthy individual and something quite different than the HEF-PEF. Um, while the healthy control has substantial cardiac reserve or contractile reserve, rather, there's really no meaningful increase in contractility among individuals with HEFREF, which underscores again the fact that HEFREF is also a diffusely myopathic process. Um, it affects the right ventricle in a different modality, in a different way than HEFPEF does, but nonetheless, we have a myopathic right ventricle. What about LVADs? I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about LVADs here. This is, uh, as, a, as an advanced heart failure cardiologist, this is something that is quite near and dear to my heart, and as Jay alluded to, he and I have spent uh, years working together to try to understand how LVADs, uh, uh, for better or worse, influence cardiovascular function at rest and exercise. 
for for people that you know, may not think about LVADs quite as much, just as a reminder of what these things are, well, they're small devices that are surgically implanted, um, surgically connected to the apex of the left ventricle, and then they provide blood flow to the body through an outflow cannula that's surgically anastomosed to the aorta. There's a small rotor inside the pump of these things, which spins several thousand times a minute, and um, normalizes a resting, I'll emphasize resting cardiac output. We're told these things can provide anywhere from four to 10 liters per minute of flow. And it's important to emphasize that when you think about these things, um, intuitively, you know, we haven't replaced the heart, we're assisting the heart, but total cardiac output, so to speak, is actually the summation of blood flow leaving from the left ventricle and or the LVAD itself. So blood comes back to the heart, to the left ventricle, it can leave by one of two um, exit pathways. We've spent years, think decades, thinking about how these things influence the left side of the heart. We develop risk score algorithms to try to predict who will develop RV failure. But I would argue that much less is known about how these devices influence the right side of the heart compared to what we know about the left side of the heart. So, um, one of the things, and I'll point out Tomi Tran, who's a uh, fellow here now, as you all know, was a remarkable resident, worked for years with me on this particular study, um, trying to answer that exact question. How does the right ventricle behave when you are supported by an LVAD? Well, um, some things that we found from this study that first and foremost, these patients suffer from res uh, severe residual heart failure, which is unmasked by exercise. Their peak VO2s, are 11.8, which is well within the range of what you would typically use as criteria to refer for a heart transplantation. But if we look at what happens, happens to these people when they get up and try to exercise, we're looking at number of hemodynamics here, first from a Swan-Gans catheter, um, white is rest, red and blue, again, are these submaximal levels of exercise to replicate real world activities of daily living. And then on the right, gold is uh, uh, peak exercise. We're looking at heart rate, right atrial pressure, pulmonary arterial pressure, and wedge pressures on the bottom. As we span across increasing intensities of exercise, we see that there are increases in right-sided pressures, pulmonary arterial pressures increase dramatically from rest. Um, to submaximal and peak exercise. And then left-sided pressures as well um, um, increased dramatically. This particularly, particular individual had a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, but um, even when he engages in submaximal levels of exercise, we see large increases in left-sided filling pressures, which um, increased almost 30 at peak exercise. So quite dramatic um, evidence that these individuals suffer from residual heart failure, which is unmasked, simply with routine activities of daily living. This is something that was quite surprising to me. These data are under review right now, but if we bring patients in and we study them before they have their LVAD, they undergo an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test before their LVAD, they come back and they do the same thing after their LVAD is implanted, and then they come back a third time and we have them do another invasive CPET, but this time we increase their pump speed with exercise. You can see that these curves are all basically superimposable. So if we look at pulmonary arterial pressures, top left, wedge pressures, top right, cardiac output, bottom left, and then as a reference, this is how LVAD flow changes during exercise. These curves are basically superimposable, which tells me that during exercise, whether it's submaximal or peak, peak exercise, the LVAD has a very limited ability to unload the heart and improve overall functional capacity, which is why I think we see that peak VO2 levels remain severely reduced following implantation of a device. And that's why I underscore the point that these pumps normalize a resting cardiac output that says nothing about their, their ability or lack of ability rather to improve functional uh, hemodynamics and improve exercise tolerance, which from these data, um, you can clearly see they really do not have the ability to do that. So these individuals have evidence of residual heart failure. What about the right side of the heart? So I showed you data looking at normal, healthy individuals. I showed you data looking at the right ventricle for a HEF-REF patient. These are uh, data on the right now, looking at how the right ventricle responds in patients with HEF-REF supported by an LVAD. And again, you can see that there is very limited 
uh, widening, none at all really, of the pressure volume loop, which underscores the fact that there are impairments in contractility. And again, these patients show evidence this in another way, that they suffer from residual heart failure, um, despite the fact that you have normalized a cardiac, arresting cardiac output with implantation of an LVAD. This is a question that comes up not infrequently. How do changes in pump speed influence the right side of the heart? As you increase the pump speed, theoretically, that has the ability to pull the septum towards the inflow cannula of the LVAD, which theoretically would increase the diameter of the right side of the heart, law of Laplace, that should increase while stress, which could theoretically precipitate RV failure. So we modeled that. Again, these are data from uh, Tomio's paper that came out earlier this year. And quite surprisingly, we don't actually see any meaningful change in the pressure volume loop as you increase and decrease pump speed. So this is um, an individual with a hardware device, baseline speed is 2560, high speed here that we got to was 2800, low speed was 2200. And anybody who takes care of these patients knows that those are very large uh, changes in pump speed. So this is a nice exposure to large changes in pump speed. And we really don't see any change in right-sided function. This uh, uh, complements very nice data from Near Uriel's group um, um, at the time was in Chicago. He's now in New York, but he did a similar thing using a Swan-Gans catheter and showed that across various stepwise increases in pump speed, you really didn't see any change in the CVP. Yes, wedge goes down, but what happens to the right side of the heart? Well, there's really no change in CVP. And when we do the same thing again with pressure volume analysis on the left side, um, whether it's changes in contractility, lucitropy, ventricular arterial coupling or myocardial energetics, changes in pump speed, um, at least under acute conditions, don't appear to have a significant impact on how the right side of the heart works. What about the type of surgery that you perform? Over the past several years, there is an increasing level of interest in studying this idea. What if you do an LVAD implantation versus a traditional sternotomy versus a lateral thoracotomy is there any reason to think or suspect that that might preserve right ventricular function in these patients? This is uh, something that Jay and I, uh, among other things, over the past uh, couple years have focused a lot of attention on this very question. How does a lateral thoracotomy influence right-sided heart function, both in the short term and the long term, compared to a traditional sternotomy? There have been several small studies looking at this. Probably the biggest one that I'll, I'll um, point your direction to here was the lateral trial, which came out a couple of years ago now, which was kind of an interesting setup. So just to walk through exactly what it was they did, it was a non-randomized single arm study, 144 patients undergoing VAT implantation, um, all had it inserted by a thoracotomy and they compared outcomes by a thoracotomy with historical controls who had it and had their VADs implanted by sternotomy. Their primary outcome here was survival at 180 days um, on the original device free from disabling stroke. And this is what they found. Overall event-free survival at six months was about 88%. And compared to their historical control data, um, which showed um, the same event-free rate was about 77%, there was a significant increase in that outcome when patients were implanted via thoracotomy. Well, that's all helpful and good, but what about the right ventricle? Uh, well, why might a, a thoracotomy preserve RV function? If you think first about how the right ventricle contracts, we know that longitudinal shortening accounts for the overall majority of right ventricular contractility. If you think about longitudinal shortening versus transverse shortening, about 80% of overall contractility comes from longitudinal shortening. However, RV longitudinal shortening is impaired following surgeries that involve a pericardiotomy and a sternotomy. Under those conditions, transverse shortening has to increase dramatically in order to try and maintain RV contractility. And then finally, if we think about LVAD implantation specifically, um, data from the uh, South Carolina group, very nice data showing that RV afterload sensitivity increases dramatically following 
LVAD implantation with a sternotomy. So there's a couple of reasons to suspect that if you put an LVAD in via thoracotomy, you may actually preserve right ventricular function or at least minimize the periprocedural decrements in RV dysfunction. So with that backdrop, with that in mind, um, Jay and I, this is uh, currently under review right now, but a small pilot study to try and investigate this. 21 individuals with HEFREF undergoing VAD implantation were randomized one-to-one -one by either a thoracotomy or a sternotomy. This is an example of what we did here. You can see we um, monitored hemodynamics in the periprocedural time frame for 24 hours by both the Swan-Gans catheter and a conductance catheter. So two, um, two sheaths, which you can see going into the IJ here, and you can see it displayed on a chest x-ray here, the Swan-Gans catheter and the conductance catheter sitting in the chest. And some interesting trends emerged. In both types of surgical implantation, pulmonary arterial pressures decline over the first 24 hours, which I've displayed in right. But if you look on the left, only with thoracotomy, the lateral thoracotomy, did we see that right atrial pressure actually declined. Whereas for patients who had LVAD via sternotomy, right atrial pressure increased, which tells you that there might be some benefit, hemodynamic benefit, at least in the short term, to having implantation via thoracotomy. What about the pressure volume analysis? Well, on the top, we are looking at a lateral thoracotomy. On the bottom, we are looking at a median sternotomy, baseline in black, post-op day zero in the ICU in the middle in red, and then 24 hours later um, before we pull the catheter in the ICU. And what we basically find is that for patients who had a lateral thoracotomy, metrics of contractility actually increased. Pressure volume area, which we use, to inform myocardial energetics actually increased. Median sternotomy, what happened? Well, there really weren't any changes in preload recruitable stroke work or cardiac output, um, other metrics of um, contractility. However, stroke work declined and pressure volume area, again, measures of myocardial energetics actually declined over time. So uh, further evidence to suggest that there could be a benefit uh, uh, to implant these devices when possible via thoracotomy as opposed to a traditional sternotomy. So with that, I'll finish. Um, I'll make a few remarks and then turn it over for any questions. Um, first, as I said, knowledge of the right ventricle has historically lagged behind that of the left ventricle. The RV is not a quote unquote passive conduit. It is quite important uh, in cardiovascular physiology. It has a substantial amount of contractile reserve in the healthy state and it actively contributes to venous return. Different disease states impart differential effects on resting and exertional RV function, as I showed you, whether we're talking about an elite athlete, a healthy person, HEFPEF, HEFREF, or an LVAD. Some of these individuals at the end of the day have a dysfunctional right ventricle, but the way they get to that point can vary dramatically between different disease states. And as I showed you at the beginning, highly emphasized by both the NHLBI and the AHA, we really need to learn more. Further research is necessary to identify novel treatment modalities to improve outcomes in patients across the spectrum of health and disease. Um, with that, I will stop. Thank you uh, again for the opportunity to um, speak this morning. It's been a wonderful visit so far, and um, I look forward to um, meeting with many of you uh, throughout the course of the day today. So thanks again. Thanks very much, Bill. That was great. I have, um, uh, we'll open up the questions, um, but while anyone may be um, speaking up to the chat. Jay, yeah. Jay can, I, um, can I, while you're waiting for questions to come in in the chat or people to raise their hands, do you mind if I ask a question? Certainly. Uh, Bill, so the data you showed on the impact of LVAD on um, um, right-sided hemodynamics. Can you tell us a little bit more about like what was the timeline after the surgery that you enrolled these individuals? Do you not yeah. see RV remodeling similar to L you see with LV remodeling post post VAD? Because you seem to get you get LV remodeling, you get pulmonary vascular remodeling. Yeah. It's just surprising to me that that the RV doesn't remodel. Yeah. So it. so for the yeah, great question. So for these studies. Um, First, when we evaluated people before and after, 
um, the LVAD went in, they were evaluated three to six months following, um, following implantation of the device. We wanted them to have enough time to fully recover from the surgery to be ambulatory, but we also needed to study them at a, at a kind of a safe point in time before complications arise, before they're transplanted, these types of things. So um, those studies were primarily done three to six months following implantation of the device. The pressure volume data that I showed, those were um, stable outpatients who, um, for the most part, were anywhere from about eight to 12 months removed from their, from, um, the, uh, their LVAD implantation. To answer your question about chronic changes over time, yes, we do see that. Um, we see that um, um, there are longitudinal reductions in pulmonary vascular resistance, longitudinal reductions in pulmonary arterial pressures. And while you may see reductions in right atrial pressure over time, if you look at the relationship between right atrial pressure and afterload, that relationship doesn't change. Um, as I, I, I mentioned in my talk, RV afterload sensitivity increases dramatically following device implantation, and that kind of carries the day, or that, that kind of explains why the right ventricle behaves the way that it does after an LVAD. So regardless of how long you've been supported, whether it's three months, six months, and, and they've studied this all the way out to two to three years, the RV is highly sensitive to changes in afterload, and it doesn't take a whole lot for it to become dysfunctional. Thanks. Okay, Bill, I've got a question from Claudio. It says, in the data that you showed where the LVAT speed does not affect the PV loop, how do you explain that? I would expect the RV preload to increase. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So the first thing, um, and we, we made this point in the paper, th this is looking at acute changes, first and foremost. Um, I, I, I would have a hesitation to take a patient who had a pump speed to 2,500, crank it up to 2,800 and send them home and without following them up closely. So number one, these are acute changes. The second thing that I'll say though, is that um, I think some of our concerns about increasing the pump speed, um, maybe uh, we may be worrying about that a little too much. Like I said, I wouldn't change it 300 RPMs and send them home packing, but I have less concern about precipitating RV dysfunction by increasing the pump speed by 20, 40, or 60 RPMs over a short period of time. The septum does not appear to move that dramatically, or at least if it does, it does not add a, it does not significantly reduce right ventricular function. So the right ventricle can still function appropriately, or, or I, not appropriately, but the change in RV function is minimal following a septal shift from increasing the pump speed. The second concern that comes up is whether by increasing the pump speed, you increase venous return to the right ventricle and you basically flood the right side of the heart and precipitate RV failure from a volume overloaded state. And again, I have to say, I think those data or that, that concern is um, not uh, borne out in the data. If that is what happened, then when we increase the pump speed by four to 500 RPMs, we should see that change borne out with pressure volume analysis. We should see a rightward shift in the location of the PV loop, meaning that it's volume overloaded. And we would kind of, we would start to see a right and downward shift in the pressure volume loop, meaning that contractility is impaired and that you're actually precipitating RV dysfunction. And you don't see that. So I think the, the, long, the, the short answer to the question is some of these concerns that we have, um, uh, the hemodynamic data just don't fully support that you're going to precipitate overt RV dysfunction by increasing the pump speed. Thanks, Bill. Um, I have a question from Dave Owens. It says, could you touch briefly on the topic of exercise in patients? Endurance exercise may accelerate the natural history, but is there a role for moderate levels of exercise in maintaining RV performance? Um, is there a, say that again, Jay, is there a role for? Or moderate levels of exercise, not ultra endurance, but moderate levels to maintain RV function. Moderate levels. Um, we, well, you know, we typically use, um, in as much as the data um, that we use to justify cardiac rehab in patients with HEFREF, which uh, we typically think of um, improving left ventricular function and quality of life and so on and so forth. Um, those data also have been extrapolated in small scale studies to suggest that, yes, there is a benefit to doing uh, some maximal um, types of exercise, i.e. cardiac rehab, to improve both sides of the heart. Um, 
that's that's kind of what we know in that area. Endurance exercise, yes, uh, those people are healthy, but as I showed, um, the longer you participate in that style or that type of exercise, the 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 greater the decrement in RV um, RV function. What about for patients with ARVCs? There a difference? That's that's uh, that's an interest. You have to those patients you have to be careful with, obviously, because when they see you, they have a dysfunctional RV, which may be prone to arrhythmia. So we're we're you know until that is sorted out, we're cautious to um, uh, provide an exercise prescription to improve right-sided performance. Uh, less is known about that. That's that's an interesting. Now, what I will say though is for patients who are referred for evaluation of ARVD, once we rule that out and they have what it, a, a dysfunctionally appearing right ventricle, um, they actually respond very well to exercise programs. We do that a lot for our patients and at least functionally, they do very well. Okay. Another question, is there a way to routinely incorporate evaluation of the right ventricle if we're doing hand grip stress testing for heart failure with preserved ejection fractions? Well, um, I, I showed you uh, invasive data, which that can be done easily in a, in a cath lab. Um, you can um, have them grip anything and monitor the uh, increase in pulmonary arterial pressure and how right atrial pressure changes. And, uh, you know, it take a little bit of time to analyze this, but it, um, if you think about right atrial pressure and how that changes in response to afterload, if you plot that, that gives you some information about um, RV afterload sensitivity. So a highly sensitive RV versus one that is less sensitive is more dysfunctional um, than the other. So yes, there are some very easy ways. You could also do it non-invasively as well and follow echocardiographic parameters to monitor RV dysfunction. Um, uh, um, during uh, simple hand grip maneuvers. Absolutely. Let me go back to Claudio's question uh, about RV preload in the setting of an LVAD. Is it possible in your mind to have a single set speed LVAD provide support both during rest and exercise? No, I personally, I don't think so. Um, it, well, it depends. I think it depends on what your outcome of interest is. If um, uh, you want to normalize a cardiac output, under resting conditions, yes, a single set speed, fine. Um, we have, um, we are doing exercise tests um, during increasingly large increases in pump speed and finding very similar results. So um, I'll give you an example. In the data that I showed you uh, um, in my presentation, with an HVAD, we would increase pump speed by about 200 RPM, or I'm sorry, 100 RPMs. In a HeartMate 3, we increased it by about 1,000 RPMs. Um, we're doing data, we're doing studies now on HVADs where we're, we are increasing pump speed by about 240 RPMs from rest to peak exercise, and we see the same exact thing. The, the curves are superimposable, which is, which is surprising to me um, in, in the LVAD's inability to decongest the heart during exercise. My interpretation of that is that in vivo, in a human heart, the preload sensitivity of an LVAD is too low to be able to handle the, the, the amount of blood that's coming back to the left side of the heart. So the result is even if you increase the pump speed dramatically, the pump just doesn't have the ability to handle that much fluid. So your wedge pressures rise, PA pressures rise, and patients have evidence of uh, residual heart failure. So I think we have a we have a long way to go um, with uh, device design before we can effectively alleviate the heart failure syndrome. Yes, their quality of life goes up. Nobody doubts that. Um, but the objective data, I would say, clearly demonstrate that these people have severe impairments in ventricular function, which manifests with evidence of refractory heart failure. Okay. Uh, one more question going back to high intensity exercise. Is there a troponin difference in patients or uh, uh, participants undergoing high intensity RV? Yes. Exercise? Yeah. So that, so that's, yeah, that's another nice. Um, so what, what the data have very nicely shown is that um, troponin increases in proportion to the duration of exercise and the severity of RV dysfunction increases in proportion to biomarkers um, that are checked during exercise. Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. I think we're coming up on the hour. Thank you, Bill. I very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, tell us uh, about the work that you're doing. I think uh, you've raised a, a number of interesting questions for 
future investigations. So thank you again. Thanks again. Thank you. Much appreciated.